Well, today we are going to talk about a very important topic. Yes, it might be serious, it might be weighty, but that, listen, that is part of our kingdom responsibility. One thing we can't do is be asleep and we cannot be silent. And so what is the opposite of that? We have to be awake and we have to be bold and expressive and we have to dig and understand the things that are facing us today. Our children, our grandchildren, and we have to fight, 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 fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. Now there is uh, an election coming and I pray all of you are registered to vote because it is our responsibility, it is our duty, it's our privilege, it's an honor. And we cannot be like an ostrich and stick our head in the proverbial sand and pretend that it's not happening. So on the ballot, there are amendments. And as I was speaking to Charles off camera, I said that as a young voter, I would just vote yes to every amendment because I thought, well, obviously they've researched this and it's good for the public, it's good for the population, except that is not always the case. So what we have to do with each amendment is understand it and understand what the implications will be. Most importantly, we have to pray over every amendment because prayer precipitates everything uh, that is important in our life as believers. And the time is short and what we do, we must do quickly. And so today I brought an expert in the field, uh, Charles DeMarco, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Jen, it's a privilege to be here. <laughs> well, Charles, you, you've been at the helm of New Life Solutions for six, seven years, right? You came out of the corporate world. Uh, you have a, a vast array of experience um, with pro for-profits, non-profits, the business world. Mm -hmm. And obviously the Lord called you to go into this. Last year, you guys had an award-winning documentary, and uh, then we were able to partner together on a project. You just came out of an incredible banquet, and God is just using you to be a trailblazer and a forerunner mm -hmm. for life. And I appreciate that you said yes to that, because you didn't have to. Mm, thank you. Well, <laughs> it's an honor and a privilege, really, really. Well, you've, you've done a wonderful job at educating people, educating voters. And when they started putting the ballot together, uh, you, you sounded the alarm. You said, hey, something, something snuck by us on, uh, while we, on our watch, and we're responsible for what happens on our watch as believers. We're going to give an account for it. And, and you said, but it can be a corrected. And that is why we're doing a program like this, because I want you to dissect for us what Amendment 4 is, what it means, and um, how we can pray mm -hmm. about what action to take when we yeah. go to that voter's booth, or even now, because some people are filling out right. their absentee voter that's ballots right. right now. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Jen. And, and, you know, I always preface, we're going to be talking about sanctity of life. We're yeah. going to be talking about Amendment 4 and the impact for, that abortion could have on trauma, not just physically, but emotionally yeah. as well, and what this would allow. But first, what I want to do for your viewers and for all of those that are listening is that I want to talk about the grace of God yeah. for a moment. Because you know, one in four individuals have walked through the pain and trauma of an abortion. That's right. And our past does not define our future. Right. And our God is a God of complete and total restoration. He is. There is healing, there is forgiveness, there is total restoration. Yes. And that's what we do as a ministry. And for those that have experienced that trauma, there is help, there is care, and there is hope yes, going there is. forward. With Amendment 4 that we see, though, that we see, and it's interesting because this really is the strategy of the pro-abortion industry. They're going to states that currently have legislation that embrace life and doing these petition initiatives mm -hmm. to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot. Right. This amendment, should it pass, and it's passed in six other states in the mm. United States already, will allow abortion up to term. So we're talking about extremely late-term abortion, on demand for any reason. And I'm going to explain what I mean, why that can happen. Yeah. Because that sounds extreme, because it is extreme. It is. And it's very dangerous. So the title of the amendment, of what everyone will see in Florida, the title is 
Amendment to Limit Government Interference with Abortion. Mm. The title by itself is very deceptive. It's very deceptive. Because it, it limits nothing and allows for everything. Yes. And here's why. The language that, that you all will see, but the language is this. Let me read the language and then I'm going to point out where it gets really deceptive. Okay. But to the casual reader, when you're in the booth reading it, it may sound affirmative. So the language is this. No law shall prohibit penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. Mm. This amendment does not change the legislature's constitutional authority to require notification to a parent or guardian before a minor child has an abortion. For those individuals that maybe are not researching or investigating, that may sound like something that to them is affirmative. Yeah. However, the reason why it's very subjective and vague and can allow abortion up to term is this. There's three key terms that are being used. Okay. The first one is before viability. If you and I were to go out in our communities and let's say we interviewed 20 people and we said, give me the definition of viability, we may get 20 different answers. Correct. Those answers might be at conception right. or six weeks right. or 15 weeks or right. 24 weeks or pain capable. If you talk to an abortion doctor, the answer will be until that baby is out of the womb. Mm -hmm. So depending on one's desired outcomes, that word means something very different. Correct. There's no definitions. The next one is, is at patient's health. Now, the authors of this amendment want individuals to think about the life endangerment of the mother. And I just want everyone to be aware, every state in the United States, regardless of their legislation when it comes to abortion, Life of the mother is the number one priority. Life of the mother right. comes first. Right. But they at least want you to think about physical health, but it could mean emotional health and it could mean socioeconomic health. What I mean is financial health. And that's the number two reason women give for having an abortion. I cannot afford this right now. According to this amendment, that would be okay. It would be acceptable. Regardless if you're 35 weeks along. The last one is as determined by the patient's health care provider. They want you to think physician, but again, that could be the abortion doctor or even the abortion clinic staff. Mm. And then that last sentence, which is so deceptive, is this sentence again, and I'll read it. This amendment does not change the legislature's constitutional authority to require notification to a parent or guardian before a minor child has an abortion. That sentence is written in a way that almost sounds like affirmative. We're not changing anything, but here's what they know. The authors of this, of this amendment know that the voter does not know that, at least in Florida right now, we are a both a notification and a consent state, mm. meaning the parent or guardian must be notified of the minor child's intent to have an abortion and provide consent. They also know the voter will conflate the word notification and consent, and they'll read it one way, thinking it's by them saying we're not going to change notification, they're basically saying we're not going to change what's already there. But by not mentioning consent, they are removing it. Mm. So Florida would be a state that the only surgical procedure a minor child could have would be something as detrimental as an abortion. And this would be the same state that if your minor child wanted to have her ears pierced or have an aspirin or in school or maybe go on a field trip, you would need parental or guardian consent. Correct. But for something as devastating as an abortion, physically and emotionally, they're saying that's healthcare, you don't need consent. Yeah, and that is deceptive, it's manipulative, and uh, the average person is not going to understand all of that. Because many times, Charles, legal jargon, and I grew up in a legal home, I cut my teeth on legal books, law books, um, legal jargon is, designed, you know, from the Latin derivatives and, and the Greek roots to, uh, you have to really be quiet, pay attention and go through each word and make presuppositions about each thing and be able to argue each word as a case. So when you go into the ballot box, you're not thinking that intensely. And so it's wrong and we, we need to be educated before we go in so that we can vote yes or no accurately according to what we feel like the Lord wants us to do. That's exactly right. That is an excellent point. Because here's the thing, this is, even though we're talking about voting and a ballot initiative and a constitutional amendment, 
what we're talking about right now is not a political issue. Right. It is a biblical That's issue. That's right. It is that politics is usurping biblical authority when they start talking about design of man and woman, sanctity of life, how God's design for marriage and family should be. That's right. And so we can talk about this. In fact, I mean, just when we look at scripture in Genesis 1, we're created in his image. Jeremiah 1.5, he knew us before we were born. Yeah. Certainly in Psalm 139, he knitted us together in our, our mother's, mother's womb. Wounds. And Ephesians 2.10, we are considered his masterpiece, yes. his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared ahead of time. Yes. This is absolutely a biblical issue because here's why. It's a life issue yes. and it's a gospel issue. Yes, that's right. And that, therefore, we have to pay attention to yes. this issue. And you know, we know the enemy. He has no new tricks. Uh, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. In that, I mean, he's the father of lies and deceit. And we've had, we had this beautiful victory with Roe versus Wade, which, you know, 30 years of prayer warriors yes. that stood in the gap. Yes. And we had this incredible victory that we're, we're just celebrating. So of course the enemy's gonna come in like an angel of light and try to insert something in a ballot to uh, undo everything that's been done. But we also know that when the enemy comes in, that like a flood, God raises up a standard against him. So this program is a standard. Uh, sharing this program is a standard. What you're doing at New Life Solutions is a standard. You know, all of the, the, the information and the, the, the pamphlets and the videos, it's a standard against the enemy and so that the gates of hell will not prevail against our children. You know, one of the things I read, Charles, that was so upsetting to me is that if this passes, and this was like, <gasps> I mean, because sometimes you don't understand the repercussions. We don't play the tape all the way through. But if this passes, that we would become an abortion tourism state, that people would come to Florida as tourists for abortions because mm -hmm. there, there's no parental consent. There is any healthcare provider can say, oh, I think you're depressed, but check. So is that what we want? Is that, that's what we have to ask ourselves. If it's yes, then by all means, you do what you, you do what the Lord is leading you to do. But if it's no, you need to understand what it means. There's 40,000 to 60,000 babies a year at stake. That's no small number, just in our state. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. Should this pass, Florida, would become one of the most radical states in the United States. Mm. And then you're thinking, well, wait, wait, California, New York, Colorado, Michigan, Washington State, those have, have some pretty pro-abortion laws in place. Florida would be right there with mm. them as one of the most radical states in the United States. And it would also become a destination state and a tourist destination state. And here's what I mean. So in 2023, there were a little over 84,000 abortions in the state of Florida reported by the Florida Department of Health. 8,000 of those were from out of state. Now keep in mind, in 2023, Florida was a 15-week threshold of a state. Okay. So if we at 15 weeks had over 8,000 out-of-state abortions, if we are essentially at term- 40 weeks. That number will triple or quadruple because we are surrounded by states. Florida is surrounded by states in the Southeast that have more life-affirming protections in place. So Florida will be flooded. Yeah. Uh, with individuals coming to Florida for their abortion. And by the way, that 84,000, that's the highest number ever reported in Florida ever. And it does not count. Um, it only counts facility-based abortions. It's, it's not counting what is ordered online, the chemical abortion pill. So as high as that is ever, it's underreported. Yeah. Similarly, nationally, they report over 1 million abortions last year. The highest number in a decade, and also only facility-based, they're not capturing all the online ordering of chemical abortion pills. So as high as that number is, it's actually underreported. Yeah, which that grieves me simply because I'm for life. Lakaim, God is for mm -hmm. life. Choose this day. You know, choose, yeah, I said before you, life and death. Choose life. He tells us which thing to choose. And we are to choose life all yeah. the time. And so, but if we don't understand languaging, and if we have a, if we could potentially be deceived, that's why we're talking today. You know, Charles, when I was a little girl, my mom 
uh, saw the movie. I think I was seventh, second, third, fourth grade. She saw the movie, The Silent Scream, and it so impacted her. She wouldn't let me see it, but uh, she would weep over it. And she really wasn't a weeping woman. I'm, I'm, I'm a weeping woman. I'm a weeping woman of Zion. You know, I, 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 I'm a weeper. Um, I'm emotional. My mother not, but she would weep over this movie from the scream. And then she would have me take little pamphlets and, and uh, you know, I guess because I was a child, I could get away with it and go door to door and put them in people's doors or put them on their, you know, on their car, on their windshield wiper. And so at a young age, I started defending life and I didn't understand everything, but I knew that someone decided to give me life when they could have decided to terminate my life. It would have been convenient. Uh, there's a, there's a, a whole plethora of reasons why they could have, but somehow, some way, they decided to give me life. Mm -hmm. And then God in His mercy, Charles, when I was 17, allowed me to meet the mother and father who were teenagers who gave me life. Mm -hmm. You know, and what a beautiful thing. And, you know, God, there's always more to the story. And for those of you that are listening, God has happy endings. And if you've been hurt, or if you, if there's a mistake that's been made in your past, listen, God is a forgiver. Like Charles said, his grace is, we can't even conceive the heights, the depths, and the breadths of his love, his mercy, and his grace. So this show is not uh, to hurt you or to trigger any emotions. We want healing, but we also want you to become an advocate. And we definitely, mostly want you to become educated about what this bill means so that you can vote accurately and you can encourage those in your sphere of influence to vote accurately. And you know, it is dangerous. It's dangerous when we don't know the ABCs and the one, two, threes. Yeah, it is. And this is an opportunity. It's interesting. In Ohio, last year, this essentially same amendment passed. And they did some research afterwards. Now, think of this. Consider this. One in three self-identifying Christians who attend church at least once a week, so highly engaged, yes. voted yes for this amendment, not because they're pro-abortion, because they thought yes was the right thing, thing to, to do, do because they weren't educated. That's why we are spending time yeah. and thank you for having this dialogue and discussion to help educate as we look through the lenses of scripture at these policies, yes. where would we fall? We have a charge in scripture to be a voice for the voiceless right. and a defender of the defenseless. And that comes out of Psalms and Proverbs. Yes. In fact, I love in Proverbs, Proverbs 31, you know, when we think of Proverbs 31, we think of the noble wife, right? The Perfect excellent woman. wife. <laughs> but in those first nine verses, it's so beautiful, Jen, because the first nine verses are a mom. First of all, a mom yeah. talking to her son, the king. And she, tells, she says her son, look, you want to be a good king? Yeah, you have all this power and prestige and influence. But you know what makes a good king? Speak up for those who are destitute. That's right. Speak up for those who have no voice. Yeah. Stand up for them. Yes. Defend them. And then we go on to with verse yes. 10, but this mother is talking to her son, yes. saying, if you want to be a good king, this is what's important, That's not right. all the other pomp and circumstance That's that comes right. along with this. And we have that opportunity right. right now in this election to be a voice for the voiceless. Right. Uh, you know, I, I often think of this event that happened to me, and I often think about, has anyone ever had to step in and save your life physically, or maybe change the trajectory of your life amazingly. And spiritually, our Heavenly Father has done that. He Absolutely. saved us when we couldn't save ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Physically here, has anyone ever stepped in and inserted for maybe certain death or changed the trajectory? And I think of this story. When I was five years old, I was at the beach with my dad here. My parents and I went to the beach. I was five years old, and we're in the water, probably not that deep, but at five, I'm not that tall now. And I wasn't <laughs> at five, so... Can you imagine me? So, and a wave came and it flipped me over on the raft. And I remember being under the water. I can't see because it's yeah. the beach water. And I thought this is taking a long time. But then in a moment, I felt my dad grab my foot and pull me up out of the water yeah. like a lobster. And in the, as I got older, my dad was, was talking to me and he said, you know, when your, I saw your foot pop out of the water just a little bit and you were already like 10 to 15 feet away from where I thought you were, and he's like, if I would not have seen you, you, you probably wouldn't be here. Wow. And I just saw it. I grabbed it and pulled it. And I think we as individuals yeah. have that same opportunity That's right. in our ballot booths to step in yes. and save the life for those most vulnerable. Yeah. 
Because if we as believers do not speak up and stand for them, right. who will? Who will? We're modeling exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, to help and serve those most vulnerable. And he gives so many definitions of tending to those that are sick, needy, hungry, yeah. visiting in prison, the unborn. And those that have walked through the pain and trauma of an abortion need our help. That's right. we, when we talk about being pro-life, Talk about being pro-abundant life. That's right. Abundant, meaning superior in quality and abundant in, in, in more than we could even think or imagine because we stand for the unborn, but for those who have walked through the trauma, we want to come alongside and help we them do. as well. We do. And, you know, one of the greatest, you know, repentance just means, Charles, that we're changing our mind, we're turning and returning, and we're helping others not make the same decision that we did. And that really is the ministry of reconciliation. It's what Jesus did. It's what Corinthians talks about. And there's so much more we can say. Um, thank you for your, mm. your dedicate. You've dedicated your life to this. And thank mm. you for being a king. Mm. And I thank you for being a queen and a king. I want you to go to newlifesolutions.org because there there's information that can be empowering. And, and just in our last 30 seconds, I just want you to pray. Oh, thank you. Father, Lord, um, we just come before you, Lord, and we give you thanks and praise for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control. We just pray that we are wise stewards and that we will embrace the charge we see in Scripture to be a voice for the voiceless and a defender of the defenseless, and that, Lord, we will embrace life and the author of life, you. We love you, Lord. We just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for watching today. Listen, you cannot be silent. You cannot be asleep. It's too important. My name's Jim Mallon. Come home. Get the information, go to the website. See you next time.